Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the online worship community of the Village Church for this fourth Sunday of Advent, December 20th, 2020. Let me remind you as we gather for worship that you may be in touch with us for prayer or to send messages or to send in your financial giving through the different email and other addresses that are printed on your screen right now. Let me also announce to you that we will have worship on the 24th of December on Christmas Eve, both in the online video version that will be available starting that morning of the 24th, as well as three times here on the campus of the Village Church. We'll gather at 4 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 8 o'clock. Now note that the time of that last service has changed from the traditional 11 p.m., or we call it the midnight service. We're having it earlier this year so that we can get in under the deadline of the expected curfew because of the pandemic. But we hope to welcome and receive many folks on that evening here at the church. Of course, we'll be observing all the different protocols, and we would encourage you to dress very, very warmly, especially those of you from Southern California, like me now, who don't deal very well with cold weather. We'll still be here, though, on Christmas Eve and online to celebrate the birth of Christ. I'll also remind you that our alternative Christmas market will be continuing for just a couple of more days. You can go on to the church website and find all the information you need to purchase those last-minute Christmas gifts that honor those you love, but then also support the many missions of our church both here and around the world. I'll announce to you as well that uh, Monday evening, January 11th, our Monday evening Bible study group will uh, pick up again with a new study about the parables. If you'd like to sign up for that Zoom group, you may be in touch with Laura Metzger at ljmetzger at gmail.com. I am filming today from the Briggs Chapel here at the church, and I am standing beside the Nativity window. This is the first of six windows that have been in this chapel now for a very, very long time. And I know many of us come and go from the campus of the church without really looking at the windows anymore. But in that time when we are able to return, I'd encourage you to take some time to study and to enjoy all the many windows we we have, especially this nativity window that celebrates the birth of Jesus. Now, one of the ways we're celebrating the birth of Jesus is by doing the things that Jesus uh, ordered us and invited us to do. And we're doing that through the Christmas joy offering this year. This is a traditional offering of our congregation in which we support different missions of the church. And this year we are focusing on ministries of feeding those who are hungry. We will do that through local and global mission partners, through folks like the New Day Ministries and San Diego Rescue Mission, folks like the Care House and Urban Life, and also through the ministries of our churches in Kenya. You may send in your check to support this special offering opportunity and note on the note section simply Christmas joy. And in that way, we'll share the joy of Christ by filling the needs of those who are hungry, especially in this time of year. So remember all of these things and take note of them and participate as the Lord leads you. But now let's prepare to worship. Charity Atkins is going to share a time with the children that frankly speaks to all of our hearts as she lights the fourth candle of the Advent wreath. Good morning, families, and welcome to week four of this Advent season. We have spent the last four weeks together lighting the Advent candles, and you can see here next to me that I already have the last three weeks of candles lit. So if you don't have those lit at home, go ahead and do that now so that we can light our fourth candle. Our fourth candle is going to be our last purple candle, and it represents love. The Bible tells us that God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son, and that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. So for this morning, let's go ahead and light our fourth candle as we are reminded of God's love and him showing the ultimate sacrifice for us. I'm going to go ahead and close us by reading a couple verses from the book of Jeremiah. We're going to be in chapters 33 verses 14 through 16. 
It says, a new day is coming, announces the Lord. At that time, my gracious promise to my people will come true. I made it to the people of Israel and the people of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a true and rightful branch grow from David's royal line. He will do what is fair and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved. Jerusalem will live in safety. And it will be called the Lord who makes us right with himself. Let us worship God. us throughout history to be his people and yet we have turned away from God and towards sin every single time God invites us to turn from our sin and to turn towards him and trust him with all the good that he has in store for us let us take a moment confessing our sins and once again be being assured of God's forgiveness join me in prayer Everlasting and always loving God, long ago you sent your messengers to tell the good news of your mercy and forgiveness, but still our ears refuse to hear, our eyes fail to see, and our hearts remain closed to you. We have ignored your wisdom and counsel regarding how we are to live. We have considered ourselves only and ignored the hurts of others. We have preferred instead to create our own truth. Sing to us again, Prince of Peace, in this holy season, that we may have still another chance to receive your gift of yourself and your Son and become messengers to others of your saving grace. In Christ the Lord, we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are forgiven, set free, renewed and restored in order that indeed we may go out and spread that good news to others. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. 
Now may the peace of Christ be with you. Share that peace everywhere you go. Amen. Star burns in the darkness, shines with a promise in men you well. One child born in the stillness, living within us in men you well. We're singing glory, glory, let there This is the time in our worship service where we lift up our prayers of thanksgiving and prayers of intercession in faith, hope, and love to the Lord. I'll offer a pastoral prayer on our behalf, and then I'll invite all of us to close with the words of the Lord's Prayer. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. In these moments, O God, we pause to recall your coming into our world, to sing songs of your joy and love, and to pray for your peace and hope. With your coming, you brought light into a dark world, joy into a painful world, hope into a fearful world, love into a lonely world, and peace into a warring world. Help us this day to remember your gifts of hope, peace, joy, and love. Help us to remember that your advent into our lives is the promise of life. God in the flesh in Jesus Christ, Give us the courage in these days to repair a manger where you might be born in us, rather than keeping you enshrined in a religion and belief, safely distant from where we live and move and have our being. This Advent, O God, while reverently telling the ancient story of your coming, 
Show us a way to prepare our hearts so that once again, your peace may be born in us and in our world. On this fourth Sunday of Advent, we find ourselves eager at the future to come. Christ our Lord comes into our earth once again with power and authority, masked with the humility of a child. As our friends, he called to walk in his footsteps. We pray for the wisdom and power to do the same. We pray to speak words and do deeds of power truly in your name with a humility to consider ourselves no higher than the neighbors that cross our path. On this day, we lift these hopes as we lift all on our hearts in prayer. Although we exemplify the joy, peace, and hope you have given us, we cannot deny the weights of sorrow and difficulty this world brings. We pray for the brokenness of our world and the brokenness within ourselves. We pray for our friends, our family, loved ones, strangers, and neighbors who suffer from ill health and the ill health of mind and heart around the world. Hear our pleas that recognize our joys and our pains. Listen to our celebrations and our tears as we enter your house with souls bare to you, our gracious creator. Lord, we lift them up, hear our prayers, and guide us to serve faithfully. We pray for Pastor Jack as he shares your word to us today. Help us to hear and receive your word that we may walk each day testifying of the one who is the word made flesh, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Greetings. Let us begin our time in the scriptures with a prayer for illumination. Please join me in prayer. O Lord, we pray that your light would pour over these pages and illumine these old, old words, that they will, would dance with newness in our hearts and minds, that we would be radiant in reflecting your word in our living and serving one another. Amen. And now a reading from the book of 2 Samuel. Now when the king was settled in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David. Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders whom I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went. And I have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones on the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time I, that I had appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And now a reading from Psalm 89. I will sing your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is a firm is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David, I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. And now a reading from the gospel according to Luke. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and now 
you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. The word of the Lord. You know, friends, it seems to me these days that we are preoccupied with two different things. One of those things, of course, is the pandemic and now the story about vaccines. The other thing that we've been preoccupied with is politics and the transition of power in Washington. Well, let me tell you, there's nothing new about our preoccupation with either of those kinds of things. If you study much history, you'll realize that there have been many historical seasons of plague and disease and pestilence, and we're living through yet another of those times. Also, of course, if you study history, you'll realize that we have always been preoccupied with the business of power, especially the transition of power. Think about all the things you know about history, about the pharaohs who ruled over Egypt, about the great Chinese dynasties, about the Roman Empire and Alexander the Great and even the great British Empire. Even in the church as we know it, we have been preoccupied with those in power, with the popes. 
I didn't know this until I looked it up not long ago, that there have been over 260 popes, the leaders of the largest part of God's family here on earth in the Christian church. And so our preoccupation with power is nothing new. And our preoccupation with those who are in control. The Bible itself actually is very interested in talking about who is in power and, and what that means for us as we live our lives here on earth. The first story of the Bible really is about power, telling us that God has the power, that everything exists because of God's power, God's authority. The Bible continues to tell the story of God as we focus on a particular group of people, the people that descend from Abraham, the Hebrew people, later on to become the nation of Israel. God gives earthly leaders to express his power, leaders like Moses and Joshua and the judges. And then God gives to his people kings, Saul, the first king, and then King David. Our scripture lesson this morning is from 2 Samuel that tells about King David, the greatest of all of Israel's kings. As the story picks up and as we enter into the story, David has consolidated the 12 tribes of Israel into one great confederacy and he is building the nation into a nation for the very first time. David has come into the city of Jerusalem, Jerusalem and, and established that as his capital. He's built a palace there for himself, a, a grand palace in which he can live. And then he begins to think that God might also need a place to live, if you will. God had been in the midst of the people, or at least represented in that way, through the, ta the, the tablets of stone that, that contained the Ten Commandments. Those tablets were kept in the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark then was kept in the tabernacle, the tent that was sort of like a, a traveling temple. But now God wanted to build a temple for God there in the capital city of Jerusalem. As the story twists and turns, though, it turns out that God does not want David to build him a temple. In fact, God says something very interesting to David through the prophet Nathan. 2 Samuel 7, verse 16, Nathan says, speaking for God, Your house, David, and your kingdom, David, shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Interesting that God was establishing the dynasty, the house, the kingdom of David as a way of establishing God's kingdom on earth. David would write some songs about that, some beautiful poetry that would become the prayer life of Israel in the Psalms. We heard a portion of that just a few moments ago, Psalm 89, where God says, I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. I will sing of your steadfast love. I declare that your steadfast love, David singing to God, that your steadfast love is established forever. And so let's get this firmly in our minds that as the story of the Bible is told, that God works among a particular people to make a great nation and family, a kingdom or a dynasty, if you will, that flows from David. And in that kingdom, in that dynasty, in those people, God will establish his steadfast love. And it's up to us to worship God and to live within that reign of God's love. So what happened with David's kingdom? What happened to David's throne, his, his dynasty? 
Well, it thrived for a while under David and then under Solomon, but then it began to falter and eventually it fell and God brought it back and then, and then it fell again. The story of the, the nation of Israel, the dynasty of David is an up and down story throughout all of history. And truth be told, our Jewish cousins still wait for a new David. They wait for a new Messiah, someone who will come and finally and fully establish the reign of God on earth through Israel. Just a few days ago, we finished the celebration of Hanukkah. What's Hanukkah all about? Well, Hanukkah celebrates the Jewish victory over the Seleucid Empire and the recapture of the city of Jerusalem in 164 before Jesus was born. Hanukkah celebrates the rededication of the temple, a time when the nation was on the upswing, if you will, as the victorious Maccabee people, part of a Jewish group, wanted to celebrate the rededication of the temple, they came and found that the, the ritual oil that had been used in the lamps of the temple had been profaned. Most of it was gone, and they had only enough for one day. But they filled the lamps with oil, and the lamps burned for eight days, not one, in a great miracle. That's why the menorah has eight lights and then one extra from which all the others are lit because the oil lasted for eight days, a sign that, that God was with the people as the nation was reestablished, as the temple was rededicated, as Jerusalem was reoccupied, and as the nation lived on. Hanukkah is all about God's faithfulness to his people to keep alive the dynasty of David. And yet, not long after that, the Roman Empire entered into the Middle East and conquered Israel all over again. And that's where Luke picks up the story. As he tells us that in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. There's David again. Something big is going on once again in God's promise to David, in God's promise to the people of Israel. You know the rest of the story. Jesus was born, and we Christians believe that Jesus was and is that promised Messiah. As Gabriel said to Mary, the Lord will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. You see, Christians believe that Jesus was God's way of saying once again, for one last time, that God's kingdom would survive, that God's kingdom would thrive. And yet, of course, we learned that God was not talking about an earthly kingdom. The existence and the power and the presence of, of the people of David, but a different kind of kingdom. A kingdom now fully realized, a kingdom fully expressed in the person, in the ministry, in the legacy of Jesus. Indeed, with the gift of Jesus, God was building his house, his dynasty, God was establishing that house, that kingdom forever, but it was something much bigger than what David was all about. You and I act like 
it never really happened sometimes. We act like we're still waiting for God to be in power, for God's kingdom still to come. And that's true. God's kingdom is not yet fully realized on the earth. That's what Advent is about. We're still in the season of Advent until Christmas Day itself. Advent is about waiting and watching and hoping. And of course, we still wait and watch and hope for the full expression of God's peace and God's truth and God's justice and God's love to be present here in our world. And yet, and yet, we believe it's already here. In the rest of life, we have these great hopes and expectations for the success of the next president, the next governor, the next mayor. We hope that the next scientific discovery, the next medical breakthrough is, is going to make life better. And all of that is fine and well as far as it goes. But God has already done something much bigger, something much better. God has done something in Jesus, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, in his reigning in power today that establishes God's dynasty, God's house forever. Now, let me say that in some different ways so that we can begin to see what that actually means for our lives. The first thing I want to say is that the world already belongs to God. Oh, I know all kinds of governments and kingdoms and, and nations exist that say, we're here now, everything's fine. The, the, the empire of England will last forever. There will always be an England. The Roman Empire will last forever. The Third Reich will last for a thousand years. Well, okay, whatever. The fact is that there's only one king of all things, and it's God. The world already belongs to God. The second thing is that the kingdom, the house, the dynasty of God already exists in this world. The king of all kings has already been born and already is reigning forever and ever. You and I, as Christians are already living in this kingdom. And we already have the only king that we actually need. That doesn't mean that we don't need human governments and human ways of organizing things. Of course we do, but there's something much bigger going on, something much longer, something much better. Christians today living all over the world are living in the reality of that kingdom of God, that dynasty of God. And so our job right here and right now is to live in this present world in such a way that honors and follows the king. We don't have to wait for anyone else to come along. We don't have to wait for anything else to happen, it has already happened in the gift of Jesus. We know that because of God's steadfast love. In Jesus, in the way that he lived, in the things that he taught, in the things that he did, in the things that he invited us to become part of doing in the world, the steadfast love of God is spreading through all the world. Our job is to fill God's house. Our job is to live in God's kingdom. Our job is to embody the reality of God's dynasty as we bring God's steadfast love into our own lives, into the lives of those whom we love, and then into the lives of those whom God loves. And of course, God loves everyone. And so friends, the next time that 
you find yourself fretting and fussing over who the president is or is not, or whether we have a vaccine or we don't, or whether you can leave home to go to someplace you want to go or not, the next time you find yourself worried or upset or, or confused about all the things that are going on in life, remember Remember that the kingdom of God is already here. Remember that the king already exists. He already reigns. Remember that you and I are citizens of God's kingdom. And as citizens of that kingdom that will last forever and ever and ever, we do the things that citizens do in God's kingdom, in spite of anything else that's going on, regardless of things are going well or going poorly, we still follow the King Jesus and we live in the way that he said we should live. God's steadfast love has arrived for us and still is present with us in the life of God's people who follow Jesus. And it's our job then, not just to enjoy that for ourselves, but to help others, to love others, to bring God's justice, God's righteousness, God's mercy, God's grace, God's call and command and claim on our lives, to bring all of those things into our hearts and into the hearts and lives of others so that one day the whole world will finally wake up and realize what we already know to be true, that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, that God's promise to Mary, that God's promise to David has always held fast and true, that God's steadfast love is forever and ever. We can trust that because of what Gabriel said to Mary and that then Jesus later would say to all of us, the Lord is with us. My question is, do we need anything else? Amen. With faith, hope, and love, let us respond to God's word through the affirmation of faith, through the holy words of sacred scripture. Let us affirm the faith together. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our Father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life.
want to give you some homework today. Homework that you can keep doing the rest of your life, I think. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, I want you to think this thought. Think to yourself, you know, today I'm living in God's house. I'm living in God's kingdom, God's dynasty. I'm living in God's house. And because it's God's house, God is the one who gets to set the rules. God is the one who says to all of us who live in his house, why don't we do things my way? Well, what is God's way? God's way is the way of love, steadfast love, love that never gives up, love that always prevails. Regardless of who's in power, regardless of what's going on, that's the truth of the gospel today and always. And so now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen.